stand we'll begin with a prayer in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost amen <clears throat> come holy ghost for the hearts of thy faithful and the kingdom them the fire of thy love send forth thy spirit and they shall be created <clears throat> let us pray O god who by the light of the holy spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful grant that by the same spirit we may have right judgment in all things and every to rejoice in his consolations through christ our lord Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, Saint Joseph, our Guardian Angels, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. All right, welcome back to everyone. Um, as you remembered from my announcement at Mass on Sunday, We'll continue now every Tuesday until we've covered the Mass. Someone had asked me exactly how many weeks do you think? And I'm going to guess, I hope, please God, by the end of September or beginning of October, we should be finished. So it all depends upon how many questions you ask and how much grief you give me that we can get through this. So I would think probably for the next, what, four, five, six weeks at least, uh, we have a lot to cover, and uh, certainly today we'll now begin with the actual Mass. Um, I have handouts. You all should have them uh, for the notes for tonight. Obviously, I have less spaces, so you can make your own, you know, scribble down your own notes if you wish. But also, I have um, notes from our l class from three weeks ago regarding church architecture and the different parts of the church, etc., which are over in the middle table here on the right. So if you want copies of those notes, um, I have made some, and so they're available there for you also. <coughs> okay, to begin, St. John, as I said, you know, you read along in the notes, that St. John Vianney loved to say often that if we really knew what the Mass was, that we would die of joy. And he said the same thing regarding the priesthood. If, we, if a priest really understood his vocation, the sublimity of it, and the power that he has, he would certainly die of joy. And so for ourselves, naturally, the Mass is the same thing. That awesome power that God has given to us, Obviously, through the passion and the death, the resurrection of our Lord, and the grace that is now available to us, the power of such a prayer, you know, in a sense, the perfect prayer that God has given to us. And certainly, the Mass uh, reflects in many ways, um, obviously, it's the sacrifice of our Lord, but also in its construction, in its order. It also reminds us that it very much contributes, reminds us of the different periods and the different points of our Lord's life. And Pope Innocent III, who lived in the 13th century, Pope Innocent, for anyone who may remember, is the great pope of the medieval times, but he was also the one who gave approval to the Franciscan order and also the Dominican order, and he was a great a devotee of the Mass and of the Eucharist, and he wrote a wonderful treatise on the Mass. I'm going to read that quote now, because it pretty much sums up the Church's um, order and idea of, of the liturgy. And he wrote that the order of the Mass is arranged upon a plan so well conceived that everything done by Jesus Christ and concerning him from his incarnation to his ascension is largely contained either in words or in actions wonderfully presented. And the Mass um, is divided into three parts reflecting our Lord's life. And from the introit, so the beginning of Mass, um, after the confidior, so from the introit into the creed, that period of the, that, se that section of the Mass comprises the 33 years of our Lord's life up to his institution of the Holy Eucharist. And then the second part, from the creed unto the Our Father, recalls the different scenes of the sufferings of our Lord. And then the third part of the Mass, from the Our Father until the last gospel, recalls the glorious life of our Lord after his resurrection. And if we remember um, from this point of view, when we consider the holy mysteries of the Mass, that it should fill our souls with a respect and a love of that great gift. 
And each time we leave our homes to go to church, that we should com- consider ourselves just like the shepherds and the magi who hastened to go and to adore our Lord in the stable. Or we can think of the holy women who followed Christ and climbed the mountain behind him to watch his crucifixion and to weep over the sorrow of his death and the enemies that had surrounded him. And before Mass, we should ask our Lord and Our Lady to obtain for us something of the great faith and the piety that was expressed by these groups of people. The shepherds, the magi, couldn't wait to adore and to see our Lord, so also our attitude should be the same. When we leave our homes, we hasten to church to fulfill an obligation, get it over with, and we can go home and do really do what we want to do. Or do we come to Mass and come to church understanding that we also hasten to come and to see our Lord, to adore Him, and to uh, give to Him our love so that we will also be, be reciprocal and also receive His love in return. Or we can think of, or we know that the Mass is the passion and death of our Lord. It's that representation of the sacrifice of Christ upon Calvary. So also is our attitude the same? Do we, we, do we picture in the sanctuary Calvary are we also, our demeanor and our attitude the same as the holy women, St. John, the Virgin Mary, who followed Christ along the way to Calvary and who were faithful and who remained steadfast, who stayed there until our Lord died? Are we also the same way? Is our demeanor and our attitude also the same, that we also wish to stay? Or do we wait until Mass is done and then we're out the door? You know, there's that lovely saying that Catholics, you can always depend upon them because they're the last ones to show up and the first ones to leave. And we all sit in the back. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea. It's a wonderful idea that contributes to an increase in our own piety, but a greater appreciation of the devotion that we should have regarding the Eucharist and the Holy Mass. And so the Mass is divided now into two parts, two main parts. What is called, and usually you'll see this listed in your uh, missiles, Mass of the Catechumens and Mass of the Faithful. In the Novus Ordo, they follow the same thing, but they've labeled it differently now. But the first part of the Mass from the beginning until the offertory is usually called the Mass of the Catechumens. And it was in the early church, that was the point of the Mass in which everyone, uh, Christians and non Christians, would gather in the church. And it was during that time that they obviously would express sorrow for their sins. They would listen to the epistle and to the gospel. They would listen to the sermon. And then at that point, in the early church anyways, at that point, all those who are non-Christians would then leave. And the Mass would continue from the offertory until communion. And it was only those who were baptized, professed Christians, who were allowed to stay in the church for the remainder of the Mass. And so from the offertory until communion, it is then called Mass of the Faithful. Obviously, Mass of the Faithful, regarding those who profess belief in Christ, who receive the uh, sacrament of baptism, and now their union is greatly expressed by their presence at the Mass, but also the fact that they obviously are worthy and are able to receive Holy Communion. Over time, that was changed so that eventually, whether you're Catholic or not, Christian or not, you're able to attend Mass. Yet, that structure is still there. You know, you'll see in your missiles, it's still labeled as that, Mass of the Catechumens and Mass of the Faithful. Now, the Mass begins... Um, the first thing that, we, that, that the priest does at Mass, apart from entering the sanctuary, preparing the altar to begin Mass... You know, it's not the confidi or the not the um, prayers at the foot of the altar that the priest really begins with, but what is it that you first see? What is the first thing that the priest does? And he makes the sign of the cross. You know, and it is the sign of the cross again? How appropriate the mass should begin with the sign of the cross, because the mass again is that representation of our Lord's passion, His sacrifice upon Calvary for our benefit and for our end. And we have to remind ourselves. I think it's a good point to reflect upon the sign of the cross. You know, how devout are we in this? It's a sacramental. It's also a prayer. You know, how much of an effort do we really put into making the sign of the cross? Or do we just sort of, you know, bless ourselves and kind of looks like a cross or something like that? And it reminds me um, of two saints. Um, I love 
the story of St. Teresa of Avila after her death. For anyone who's familiar with St. Teresa of Avila, if you're not, you should read her life story. She wrote her own autobiography. She was a Carmelite nun in the 17th century who reformed the Carmelites. And if you're familiar with the Carmelites, at that time they become very um, laxed. They had become very relaxed in their rule, in their prayer life. Um, and I'm not going to go into details about that. The St. Teresa of Avila was a great saint who went around Spain reforming the Carmelite order. And the way they are today, their rule, their habit, um, their structure, their prayer life, etc., still follow, at least those who are faithful, our Carmelites here in Littleton, follow the rule of, of St. Teresa of Avila. And that goes back to the 17th century. But she was a great saint, very, um, very mystical, very profound, and yet very simple, down to earth, and a real, I mean, we could all pull up a chair and become a real good chum with St. Teresa of Avila. She was a, a great saint. But after her death, as the story goes, one of her sisters, I think it was the one who succeeded her as the, uh, as the mother superior of the Carmelite order, after St. Teresa of Avila's death, she appeared to this particular nun. And amongst other things, St. Teresa of Avila had remarked to this particular nun that she had gone to purgatory. So if you can imagine this great mystical saint, St. Teresa of Avila, great gifts, wonderful insights, had done wonderful things and accomplished so many good works at a great sacrifice to her own life that she had to go to purgatory. And this particular nun was rather shocked that she had to go to purgatory. And St. Teresa of Avila rebuked her and told her, I went to purgatory, even though for a brief amount of time. And I went there to purgatory because I made the sign of the cross once very carelessly. And she said her time in purgatory, even though it was brief, she said it was the most awful experience that she had ever had. So that kind of is very uh, enlightening for all of us. When I heard that story, I thought, he. If St. Teresa is going to do that, what about me and all my own foibles? But obviously, St. Teresa was a great saint. She had many gifts and was blessed with many things. And as our Lord said, to, whom, to him who much is given, much is expected. So we all, it's a good reminder for us to remember that the, the sign of the cross is not just some little thing that we do, just out of a mere habit, but it really is a sacramental. It's a means of grace, but also it's a prayer. And there's the St. Bernadette uh, Subaru, the um, seer who received the apparitions of Our Lady of Lourdes in the mid-19th century. St. Bernadette Subaru, for anyone who has a chance to read the biography that was written about her by a French priest, um, Francois Trousseau, T-R-O-C-H-U. I think it's one of the best biographies ever written on St. Saint Bernadette. In St. Bernadette, it was known that people would flock to her or they would stand around and watch her whenever she made the sign of the cross. You know, they were just amazed at how beautifully and how devoutly she made the sign of the cross. And we can all sit around and ask, well, why did she do that? And I think it's quite obvious. St. Bernadette had the best teacher regarding her own prayer, and that was Our Lady. You know, for anyone who's familiar with the apparitions of Our Lady of Lourdes, when she appeared to Bernadette, the first thing that they would do, they wouldn't converse with each other or do anything else, that, that St. Bernadette would go down on her knees and she would begin the rosary. And Our Lady of Lourdes would pray the rosary with St. Bernadette. And St. Bernadette was asked later on during the um, questions about the apparitions and all that, she was asked, St. Bernadette was asked, uh, questions regarding Our Lady praying the rosary. And, and she was asked, you know, did she pray the entire rosary with you? And St. Bernadette made a comment. She said, well, you know, whenever we prayed the rosary, she didn't pray the Our Father with me. She didn't pray the Hail Mary. Um, but I would see the beads move in between her fingers. But she said that whenever we got to the Glory Be at the end of each decade, that she would recite the Glory Be with St. Bernadette and she would bow. But it was the sign of the cross at the beginning of the rosary and after the rosary that obviously had a great profound effect on St. Bernadette, so much so that she imitated the same thing, that she also made the sign of the cross so devoutly, so well, that people would stand around and watch her do it. It was so beautifully done. So I think it's a wonderful example for us to remind ourselves of the sign of the cross, that it is a prayer, it's an act of adoration to the Trinity, but it's a sacramental for us. And how careless are we regarding that sign of the cross? So the Mass begins now with the sign of the cross. Afterwards, we then go into what's called the 
commonly call the prayers at the foot of the altar, Psalm 42. You know, the, church, the liturgy, the mass, if I can say it, is rift with all um, scripture, you know, with many psalms, uh, different readings, obviously the epistles and the gospels. No one can ever say that the traditional Latin mass is not scriptural because it certainly is. You know, it begins, uh, middle, end of the mass are always different quotes from either epistle or gospel or the psalms. And so the church begins the mass with Psalm 42, which is a psalm written, obviously, by David expressing sorrow for sin, but also a profound desire to prepare himself for what God has blessed him with. And so the church uses that psalm, obviously, to express the same for ourselves, that we are now at Mass, and we're going to prepare ourselves, and so we ask God to make us worthy to be here at the sacrifice of the Mass, and to dispose ourselves more to the gift of his grace. And so the Psalm 42 is a prayer to remind us of the fall and of our dependence upon God in his grace. It is a preparation for the gift of grace that we all receive because of the redemptive sacrifice of Christ. And as the priest descends the altar steps, he represents fallen man who once enjoyed an intimate relationship with God. And after the fall, we were driven from his face, and as a consequence, we were to live in the valley of tears. And however, we are not left without hope and a promised redeemer to come to us. And so this psalm petitions God that he may further detach us from this world and its spirit and all its empty promises. And we ask God that he keep us on the straight and narrow path and to keep clear our way to heaven. And originally the psalm, you know, a lot of things in the liturgy that we enjoy today often were things that were introduced as, I guess we could even say, private devotions or uh, piety uh, from the clergy, or even sometimes from the laity. You know, so Psalm 42 was a private prayer recited by the priest as he prepared you know, to begin Mass, or if he walked from the, sanctu- or from the sacristy into the sanctuary, he would begin to recite from Psalm 42. And over time, it became such a habit with many of the priests and the clergy that the church took it and included it as a part of the Missal. So it actually started off as a devotion. Same thing with the last gospel. You know, the last gospel um, was recited as, um, as a counteract to all those heresies in which the, you know, our Lord was denied, his divinity was denied. So to emphasize that, because that's what the last gospel is, um, priests would have recited after Mass in the sacristy. So eventually it became and was included as a part of the Mass and obviously to counteract that heresy, so uh, the divinity of our Lord. So Psalm 42 is now a part and how appropriate a psalm it is that it reminds us of our need upon, of God and of all his grace. And next, the confidior, you know, confidior coming from the Latin word meaning to confess, um, is recited by the priest. And now if you notice in the Mass, it's recited first by the priest separately from the faithful. And with the Novus Ordo Mass, it's recited together, the priest and the people recited together. But again, it emphasizes the priest's need uh, of his own, um, of his own uh, contrition and his own sorrow for sin so that he may dispose himself better to all the graces that God gives to him but also so that he may, in his own vocation, in his own role as another Christ, to better dispose himself so the graces that he will give to you, certainly through his vocation, and also through his, um, that unique role that he has in the Holy Mass. And so the priest will then begin the confidior, again expressing sorrow for sin. And the confidior is recited by the priest, because he realizes, just as we all do, of our own unworthiness and of our past sins. And the priest, as altar Christus, now takes upon himself the sins of the world and bows low before the altar and recites his contrition to God. And so if, we, if you want, you can imagine the priest as he stands before the altar as our Lord in the Garden of Olives who was burdened down with the sins of the world and earnestly begged the mercy and the grace of God. And the next two prayers following the confidior uh, are the absolution prayers, 
um, miseriatur vestri omnipotens Deus et demisus peccatus vestris perdugat vosa vita materna amen. May the Almighty and merciful of all, Lord grant you pardon and remission of all your sins and then the indulgentium, you know, in which we bless ourselves because we're now receiving a, an absolution, you know, a, absolution only from venial sins, not from mortal sins, to better prepare ourselves again for the graces that we receive in the Holy Mass. So those two prayers are begging, uh, begging God's mercy, but also receiving an actual absolution. And that's why we have, before the changes, um, was having a second confidior, you know, before Holy Communion. Again, to better prepare ourselves to receive the graces that we will obtain through our reception of Holy Communion. And the Church wants us to be so better prepared that it does the second confidior and again gives the indulgentium in order to absolve us from venial sins so that our soul is all the more purified to receive that grace from the sacrament. And then next we begin with the introit. So the priest will then ascend to the altar, and as he ascends, he doesn't kind of look around and look at his watch and think, okay, I've got to get going, I've got to start, I've got to get this going. What does he do? Again, he recites more prayers. You know, as he ascends to the altar, he himself prepares himself to, uh, again, to dispose himself in what he is about to do. So he, as he ascends up to the altar, he asks God to make him worthy as he enter into, into this holy of holies, that he will be disposed and prepared well enough so that he may offer a perfect sacrifice. And then once he gets to the altar, once he gets to the altar, he bows down low, and again he asks God for the grace to be worthy. Not only does he ask the grace, but he also invokes the saints. And if you'll notice that the priest, when he gets to the altar, he'll bow down down and then he will kiss the altar and it's during that prayer that he invokes the saints but also the saints whose relics are in the altar the saints and of these saints and as he says that he'll bow down and he'll kiss the altar you know he'll he'll venerate the relics of the martyrs who are contained in the altar so he's invoking all the saints but especially he says those saints who whose relics are here who are contained here that through their prayers I may be worthy to offer this holy sacrifice so as the priest goes up, he's preparing himself even more so by invoking the grace and the mercy of God. And then he'll move over to the epistle side of the, um, of the altar, and he'll then begin, what well, we say, be, begin properly with the Mass, with the introit. And it's called the introit, coming from the Latin word, meaning introite, meaning to enter into, to come into. You know, and in the early church, in the medieval, in the Middle Ages, you know, the introit was, um, was sung by the choir as the priests and the clergy would process into the church and into the sanctuary. You know, so it's appropriate that it's called introit. Again, it's usually a quote from the Psalms or maybe a reading, you know, one of the uh, quote of our Lord or maybe even St. Paul sometimes, depending upon the feast day. And the introit is a verse from either a psalm of the Old Testament or maybe a reading from St. Paul, one of his epistles, or a quote from our Lord, and it varies according to the feast and the seasons of the church. And on feast days of saints, the introit, what it usually does is it prepares us and gives us an idea of what we can expect with the running theme, running theme, the running theme is all through the Mass. You know, so on the feast of saints, the introit will introduce the vocation, or the particular work, or the sufferings of the saint of the day. And on Sundays, the introit will announce some truth of our faith or virtue, but as often as a petition of mercy and of grace. And sometimes the introit can also be an act of praise or an act of thanksgiving to Almighty God. So in a sense, the introit prepares us for we, we can, what we can expect all through kind of like the the beginning petition you know God this is what we ask for we commemorate this saint just as much as he performed that virtue or was very sacrificial in this work so also may we receive the same grace that saint was able to accomplish those things so also through his intercession on his feast day today prepare us and also open our hearts to those same graces you know so the intro kind of gets you going kind of gets you an idea of what we're going to do and how this is going to happen and what's, what are we going to pray about and pray for today? Yeah, that's just their own devotion. Yeah. 
Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I think some people just get into the idea that they're saying the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, so they also will bless themselves. That's just a devotion. Yeah, that's just a devotion. I instruct the altar boys. Uh, some of them will do that, too. Every time the glory be or they'll bow down, I instruct them that in the liturgy, even this is, you know, you're talking about the rosary, but even in the liturgy, such private devotions do not enter into it because, again, it's not about us. It's for God, and so we follow a particular structure and order. Um, so, yeah, some of the altar boys will do that, bless themselves whenever the glory be is recited. That's just a devotion. Yeah, that's just a devotion. Steve. Yeah, and it wasn't, you know, a lot of things were taken out of the Mass because we forgot why it was there in the first place, but also I think because it was a later introduction and wasn't seen as a core heart of the liturgy practiced almost 2,000 years ago, they just thought it was a cute little add-on, so we don't need this. So it was, it was done away with, unfortunately. And I remember hearing um, some of our seminarians when I was in the seminary who were older vocations, they said that was one thing that they noticed most about the Mass when it changed in about 64, 65, as that was dropped immediately. The last gospel, the prayers at the foot of the altar, they, that really surprised them because uh, you just went right into the Mass and, and vernacular was already introduced. So that was something that really surprised them. And I, I, I think that's why. Because it, it was seen as a later development a thousand years afterwards, so we don't need to do this anymore, so let's just get rid of it. But obviously forgetting the whole history and what, what it was all about, you know, for our own greater preparation, for the great sacrifice that was to, to take place for, for our benefit. John. Yeah. That's just a comment of mine. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, that's right. Sure. Sure. Emma? No, I, I, I'm, I, you know, the responsorial psalm kind of took the place of what we have, the gradual and the uh, alleluia, which is recited by the priest after the epistle. So I guess to have a greater petition of the f participation of the faithful, they went ahead and kind of did that as a, a replacement of what the priest did with the gradual and the alleluia. Yeah. Emma? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was uh, that's the um, right of Christian initiation for adults. Yeah, that was uh, that that was all introduced reintroduced again. You know, in, in the nineteen seventies, again to give this idea is that you know they were present and then they would leave and then they would do their own instruction and then they would come back for the offertory, which I think is kind of a fudge because they didn't come back until. Well, they left. They, le they, they, they would come back at the offertory, whereas in the early church, they left at the offertory. Yeah, yeah. That, would, that was the idea, was to sort of reintroduce these ideas of what was happening um, from the early church. Yeah. Magdalene. I think we do. I, I, I know that we have a list of them. Four, there's about four martyrs in there. I think two or three. I, I forget. Actually, Magdalene, I forget now. I don't remember, but I, I, from what my understanding is that we lost the papers, so I don't think we really know for sure who's in, whose relics are in there. Yeah, that, that's my guess. Yeah, un unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, good. So from the introit, the priest then concludes the introit with the glory be. He'll then move over to the middle of the altar, and there he will recite uh, the Kyrie eleison. Um, now that's an interesting uh, introduction introduction. That's an interesting, um, how do I say it, um, diversion from the rest of the, litur of the language of the liturgy. You know, can someone tell me how many languages, oh, you look at your notes. Anyways, can somebody tell me without looking at your notes, don't look at your notes, how many, how many languages are in the liturgy? Ugh. The kid answers. Uh, can someone tell me apart from Latin, what is the other language? And well, Hebrew, Hebrew, Alleluia. Alleluia is not a Latin word, neither is it a Greek word. So in the, in the Mass, there are three languages, Latin primarily, Greek, and then Hebrew. Um, 
it's, an, it's interesting how uh, the language evolved because in the early church, what was the language that was used the most for the first 200 years? It, it was Greek. You know, Greek was the uh, common language in the Middle East of trade. You know, so if you wanted to trade, if you were a businessman, uh, if you wanted something, it was often from the Greeks that you would go to. They were the merchants. But the Greek, you know, Greek, uh, the Greek language was the language of business, if I can say it that way. And Greek was spoken by, by many people. So in the early church, uh, after the ascension of our Lord, it was Greek language that was used in the Mass up until about the second or third century. Uh, and that would have been probably after um, you know, the Edict of Milan in 312, or 313, 312. Uh, by Constantine, in which the church was permitted to to practice publicly. Um, yeah. Oh, really? Interesting. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, because it, in in the early church, you know, it was Greek in which the gospel was written. It was Greek that was uh, the language that was used uh, for the gospel to be recorded. And also in the liturgy, you know, it was it was Greek that was used up until about the third century, um, and then as the church expanded, and obviously um, Rome, uh, the Roman language, Latin at the time, then began uh, to take its own uh, predominance, and it was I'm trying to remember from my notes here. Uh, oh, oh, over time, as the church expanded through the Roman Empire, and when Rome became the primary seat of the successor of Saint Peter. Latin was also used in liturgy to express greater union with the Pope. But for whatever reason, even, even afterwards, Greek was still prominent in the liturgy. And at what time, at what point, you know, was Greek no longer used or it was, you know, fid fiddled down right to just the Kyrie eleison, I'm, I'm not sure. In all my research, there was no particular date or exact time that was specified in which Latin then really became the predominant um, language in the liturgy. Um, but Greek um, is retained with the Lord have mercy. So the priest goes to the middle of the altar, faces the crucifix, and invokes mercy from God. And it's done nine times, uh, three times each, in honor of each person of the Trinity. And I also, in reading and doing research for this, uh, one of the books that I read also said that it was nine times, uh, the Kyrie eleison, Christi eleison, nine times in honor of the nine choirs of angels. So just as the angels were given the great gift and they freely rejected it, so in honor of the angels, in honor of, well, to, to counteract you know, the uh, apostasy of the fallen angels, we invoke God's mercy and how the angels also intercede on our behalf and certainly are present at Mass. I thought that was an interesting, I never thought of that until I, um, I read that yesterday. But primarily it's done nine times, three times each in honor of the, each person of the Blessed Trinity. And then we go into the, oh, Bob. Not Aramaic, no. That would have been, you know, Aramaic was sort of the, uh, the common language. Hebrew was the sacred language. You know, Hebrew was the language that was used in uh, the temple and in the sacrifices and in their prayers, etc. Aramaic is just sort of, um, what do you call it? Um, yeah. Uh, Aramaic, yeah, Aramaic. But when he prayed, he would have prayed in Hebrew. Yeah, he would have prayed in Hebrew. You know, and that's the beauty of of liturgy, it's fully understood even in some cultures today that there's a particular language that is not used for conversation, but is only used in their worship of, of God, you know, or others, other pagan religions, um, such as, you know, the Hindus, they use Sanskrit, which is not an everyday language, it's not a conversational language, but they set it aside for their own particular worship of their gods. So there's always been this understanding, again, that there's something that is set aside, that is sacred and holy, that is used only in worship of God. You know, continue, it further contributes to the whole mystery, obviously the mystery of God, but also our, the fact that we can't, we're not going to get it all here on earth, and it further contributes to all that mystery. And, the, and language is a part of that, you know. So for us, Latin is, uh, is the primary language, even today, it's still the primary language of the church, officially. Is 
True. Th that's right. Exactly. That's right, Bob. Yes, exactly. Because it is, it is always changing. And that's the beauty of having a quote unquote dead language is that it no longer, it doesn't change anymore. And so it, you know, the meaning of whatever it is that we're using it for always remains the same. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yes. Good. All right. We'll take a five minute break and then we'll continue on with the, uh, with the Gloria. Mm. Okay, if you want to take your seats, we'll continue on now. <coughs> so following the Kyrie eleison in which we invoke the mercy of God, we then go into the Gloria. And the glory we go from invoking God's mercy into praising God. You know, and the Gloria begins obviously Gloria and Excelsis Deo, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of good will. And that is a quote obviously from the angels when they rejoiced uh, and appeared at the shepherds uh, at the time of the birth of Christ. So the, the church in the Gloria uses that first quote of the angels uh, giving praise to God uh, for the birth of our Lord in Bethlehem. And the Gloria, uh, if you read it over, is a is very beautiful prayer. It really is. It's, uh, it's an act of praise to God. You know, it's an act of praise of our acknowledgement of him as the highest. You know, to him all glory, all praise, all honor, all thanksgiving is to be given to him. Because obviously in the end, we are dependent upon him for everything. And this prayer really is an act of joy and of praise and of thanksgiving to Almighty God. It is an expression of gratitude and joy for our redemption, which is renewed in every holy mass. And the church borrows from the angels that song of joy which they sang above the manger of the infant God and adds to it her own expression of gratitude and praise. And after we have praised God for his great glory, we then turn to God the Son, who sits at the right hand of the Father, and call upon him for mercy and goodness. And we behold in our Savior as the Lamb of God, who is sacrificed for the sins of the world. And we implore him again in the glory to take away our sins and to receive our prayer. And we then extol that praise uh, and we continue it on and give it to the Holy Ghost as the one who is the sanctifier and the protector of our souls, the one who gives to us that grace and who dwells within our souls in a special way. And the glory is a sublime hymn of praise, and we should repeat it in the spirit of a joyful welcome to our Savior, who is soon to be born anew upon the altar as he was born in the cave at Bethlehem. And then following the Gloria, the priest then turns around and he greets the faithful with Dominus Fubiscum, the Lord be with you. And then you all, while well, the altar boys on your behalf, respond, Ecum Spiritu Tuo, and with thy spirit. Uh, it's an interesting, and I will go into this later, as Father had mentioned, I think about a month ago in one of his sermons, uh, the Dominus Fubiscum, the whole history of it, uh, what the idea is behind it, but also that there are nine times in which the priest greets Dominus, nine, I think yeah, nine times, seven, nine, seven, nine, I think it's nine, in which he greets Dominus Fubiscum, but if you'll notice, there's only, uh, only twice in which he does not turn to the, faith, to the faithful and give you or greet you with Dominus Fubiscum, but we'll go into that later in the Mass. But the idea is that he's turning towards you and asking, asking our Lord that he may be present with you, that he may be present with you within your soul by his grace. And then, of course, you respond back to the priest and with thy spirit, that our Lord will also be present with you within your soul by his divine grace. And I think the, uh, I think the, the meaning is lost a little bit when, obviously, in the new translations and the new mass, when it says, and also with you. I mean, it, it seems to be much more profound with thy spirit because it is the grace of God, it is the Trinity that dwells within our souls, within our spirit. 
And so obviously it seems to be much more, uh, much more profound and obviously a better translation regarding thy spirit. So um, that's the idea. And then the priest will begin with the collect. Uh, and then he'll go back to the epistle side of the altar and begin will be in a, in a nicer way saying the opening prayer. You know, the collect is called the collect because it, um, it's a collectio, I suppose, or a gathering of the particular petition that the priest is invoking from God for that particular mass, whatever that might be. Obviously, a feast day of a saint, um, invoking the intercession of that saint on our behalf, that whatever virtues he practiced, that God will also give to us that same grace and those virtues. So it's called a collect because it kind of um, ties up or introduces us to what we're asking for at that particular mass for that day. And then after the collect, oh, and also oremus, he begins it with oremus, uh, let us pray. You know, let us pray together, that together we are of, a one sa- of same mind, same idea, and same petition to Almighty God. So or- oremus, let us pray. He, he is, he, the priest is inviting you to pray with him uh, in that particular prayer, asking for your um, participation and your own um, petitions uh, with him to God for that particular, for that certain intention um, for the Mass. Then after, actually I, I, have, a, I have a summary here. I'm going to read it here. Every collect is usually divided into three parts. First, the invocation. Um, Almighty and eternal God, Heavenly Father, O Lord Jesus Christ. And the subject or the matter or by which we desire by the prayer, so the particular intention for that day in which we're asking from God. And then the third, the end of the collect, which is called the pleading, that we ask this prayer through the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ. As our Lord told us in the gospel, if you wish to ask for anything from me, pray for it in my name. And so that's what we're doing. We're asking in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by the merits of his passion and death upon the cross. Heavenly Father, that you will grant to us that petition. You know, we are unworthy, but we know that through the merits of our Lord, by the grace that he has won for us, that our prayer is all the more pleasing to you. So we're asking you through Christ that you will grant to us our intention. So you'll notice that most, most of the time, all the prayers in, end that way, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Unless the prayer itself is directed to Christ, then it will say, um, you know, whatever it is, O Lord Jesus Christ, etc. You who live and reign with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So if we're praying directly to our Lord, we certainly don't have to ask him, and through your merits that you will grant us our petition. Because we're already asking our Lord directly. But most times the prayers are directed to God the Father, and therefore conclude that through the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his name, that you will grant us our intention. Then from the collect, we then go into the epistle. You know, the epistle uh, in the early church, you know, it was often just a copy of a letter from St. Paul that someone would then read um, to instruct the faithful. And so the church continues on with that. You know, the, the epistle and the gospel usually correspond with the same um, lesson or the same uh, instruction that the church wants us to learn for that particular day. So they usually correspond the same. Uh, not all the time, but in most cases they do. You know, so the epistle is often a letter taken from the Apostle Paul. In, in most cases it is. Um, and then sometimes from the other apostles, James or St. Peter, you know, he wrote two letters that we have, uh, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. Uh, but most of the time it's from St. Paul because there is such a plethora of information, so much instruction, uh, some admonition uh, regarding our own lives as Christians and what we're supposed to be doing. You know, uh, especially in, in the variety is to all the different churches that he founded, Corinth especially. Uh, Corinth is quite interesting because for anyone who was uh, familiar with Corinth, Corinth was kind of like the, um, how do I say it, the California, the L.A., or the New York City of the Roman world. Every perversion, every decadence that you could think of, you could find it in Corinth. So, of course, the Christians at that time, called the Corinthians, 
um, they were quite confused because they were surrounded with all this decadence and how are we supposed to be living our lives as Christians, what exactly are we supposed to be doing? And St. Paul often had to go back to them and tell them again, tell them again, tell them again, you can't be like the rest of the pagans because you have given your life now for our Lord. Therefore, your life is to reflect what he teaches and gives to us in the gospel. And so he's constantly going back and instructing the Corinthians about what they're not supposed to be doing. Obviously, they were either severely tempted or confused, or maybe they were playing around a little bit and thinking, well, we can kind of dip our fingers over here a little bit and kind of play around there. You know, not a big deal. But he was always going back and instructing them, you can't do that. You're not supposed to be doing that. So often, there's a lot of letters from, from, uh, to the Corinthians. And obviously, these letters are timeless because, as we all know, human nature never changes. It's always the same from age to age. Same follies, same sins, same attachments, etc. Therefore, our constant need for the grace of God. And a practical lesson that when we actually sit down and read the epistles and think about it and meditate, obviously it's a moment of grace for most of us. So when we're at Mass, again, we're not supposed to be looking at our watches or thinking, oh, I wish I could sit down now. I've been kneeling too long. It is a time for us to really reflect upon what St. Paul is telling us. Obviously, God is telling us through his apostle what is the lesson that we are to learn today and how are we to take that and apply it to our own lives. How are we to apply that so that we are more faithful, certainly more fortuitous, and therefore a better example to our neighbor for our own salvation, but certainly for the sake of those whom we come in contact, those whom we are responsible for. And so often the, the lessons, uh, the epistles are taken from the, letter of, le- the letters of St. Paul. And then, finally, uh, after the epistle, uh, the server responds, Deo gratias, thanks be to God. You know, thank you, God, for giving to us this lesson, this admonition, and hopefully we will now use it and apply it to our everyday lives. So we say, thank you, God. After that, the priest then begins what's called the gradual and the alleluia. You know, the gradual formerly consisted of an entire psalm or a series of psalms that were sung with great solemnity during the Holy Mass. And the gradual is called the gradual because it used to be sung from the steps of the altar or the pulpit. Gradus, G-R-A-D-U-S, is Latin word for step. And so it was in the sanctuary that the uh, choir would sing um, this particular psalm. Again, that psalm reflected the uh, lesson, what we learned from uh, the epistle, or our further preparation now, not only to uh, having received the words of the Apostle Paul, but all the better now to prepare ourselves for the words of our Lord himself. And so it works into that. You know, we're preparing ourselves now to hear the gospel, hear the words of our Lord. So it's called the gradual, coming from the Latin word gradus, meaning step, because it was sung in the sanctuary on the steps of the altar. And Pope Gregory the Great, who died in the year 604, reduced the length of the Psalms to the present few verses that are now recited by the priest following the epistle. Then afterwards, the priest then recites the Alleluia, and then he will move to the altar, middle of the altar, and he will then begin a prayer in which he prepares himself to be worthy now to proclaim and to himself recite the words of our Lord in the gospel. And if for anyone who, whenever you have a t- chance to look over that prayer, you know, it's two prayers. And the first one, the Mundo Cormeum, the prepare my heart, O Lord, just as uh, I, the prophet Isaiah was prepared by you to preach your word by the vision of an angel who came and touched his lips with a hot coal, so, and that's in the prayer, so also my lips may be worthy to proclaim your words. You know, you be domine benedicere, bless me, O Lord, that I may be worthy to word that I may worthy proclaim the words of your holy gospel. So the priest goes in the middle of the altar, and it's that point, as we talked about three weeks ago. Remember that the focus of the sanctuary, apart from the altar, is the crucifix. You know, it's not the tabernacle. Uh, liturgically speaking, it is the crucifix that is the central point of the church and of the sanctuary. So it's the, at that point, that's the first time, if you'll notice, that if the priest is doing it, he'll look up to the crucifix first, 
and then he'll bow low and begin his two prayers in preparation for the gospel. And that is the first time that the priest will look up at the cross. And when he does the Gloria, he's actually not supposed to look at the cross. It's at that point, because he's now directly asking our Lord, petitioning him that he may be worthy to proclaim his words. And then he will move over to the gospel side of the altar. And at that point, you'll notice that the altar boy will pick up the missile and the missile stand. And as I say to them in a V formation, so they'll remember, or as someone says to it in um, flocking, what is it called, flocking seagulls formation, you know, a V, uh, that the altar boy will then move to the uh, gospel side of the altar and place the missile there. And the whole history of moving the epistle from the, epi- uh, the uh, missile from one side of the altar to the other expresses the fact that we've now gone from the Old Testament and we're now moving into the New Testament from what was um, prefigurements of our Lord, if the Old Testament is read, we're now going into that completion of those prefigurements of all the prophets, what they had awaited, we're now with Christ. And if you also notice that the priest, when he recites the gospel, he recites it on an angle. And if you remember, in the early church, when churches were built, the idea was that what we call odd orientum. You know, odd orientum comes from basically to, to the east. You face the east. And the idea uh, from the prophet, I think it was the prophet Ezekiel. Oh, I can't remember which prophet it was now. But he talked about when we pray, we turn to the east from whence our salvation comes. So the church uses that. But also, um, in the early church, Mass was said early in the morning, at the beginning of the day, and the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. So the rising sun, the Son of God, the resurrection. So liturgical east, of course, now we don't build churches so that the sanctuary is actually facing east, but what we call liturgical east. So you can kind of think of the sanctuary and the altar facing east. So if that's facing east, so when the priest turns on an angle, he's facing north. And the idea was that the, um, the priest is now reciting the gospel to the pagans in the north, hoping for their conversion. Because um, in the early church, it was uh, to the north where all the pagans were, all the tribes, all the Germanic tribes, all the, um, what are the other ones? Germans, the Goths, the, all the ones from France who were giving Rome, uh, uh, the Franks, the Gauls, yeah, uh, the Celtics. All the pagans were in the north, so that's where all the missionary work had to be done. So at that time, and because they were coming to invade Rome after the fall of the empire, so the church would then face north in the hopes that those pagans would be converted to Christ. So, the chur- so when the priest recites the gospel, he's reciting it on, the, on an angle facing north in the hopes of their conversion. And of course the church continues on with that tradition, obviously that the words of the gospel will convert our own hearts to not only those who do not know or do not accept Christ. And then of course after the conclusion of the gospel, the priest will pick up the missal and kiss the words of the gospel and he'll say by the words of this, you know, by the words of the gospel, you know, may my sins be blotted out. You know, and they be, may they be forgiven and be erased that through the words of our Lord that we'll take him into our heart, into our souls, and therefore give up our sin and convert to him and give our lives to, to our Lord. Also, at the beginning of the gospel, I forgot, you know, that remember that we make the three signs of the cross on the forehead, on the lips, and in the heart. That the words of our Lord will be in our mind, ever on our lips, and always in our hearts. And so that's, that's our own um, personal preparation for the gospel. Okay, it's now past eight. So um, any other last questions, complaints, compliments? John? Yeah, we talked about that in our first class. Yeah, this this overemphasis on the sacrifice, the um, the uh, communal meal of the mass. Yeah, when it's both, it really is both. But primarily, it is the sacrifice of Christ. 
It is that representation of our Lord's sacrifice, that by it we are saved. Right. Okay, good. How are you? Oh, Natalie? Mm. Amen. Yeah, that's a mistranslation. Yeah, to m- peace on earth to men of good will. So if you're got, you have a good heart and you're open to God's grace, then you're going to receive that pre- that peace. But the usual translation now is to peace, peace to all to all men, good will or good will to all men. I think it is. Yeah, that's a mistranslation, because uh, if you're not going to be faithful to God's grace, then you're not going to have that peace. You know, and you're not worthy of it. So yeah, peace to. Oh, probably. Yeah, probably. We're all included. Yeah. We're all going to go to heaven. Okay. <laughs> if you'll stand that way, end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Most sacred hearted Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Good. Good night, and we'll see you next week. Please, God.